Jean Ann Childs was born in 1958 and went by Jeannie. Her mother described her as a wonderful person with a big heart. In 1993, at the age of 35, Jeannie lived in the Horns Towers apartment building in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and had turned to prostitution. She was separated from her husband and had a four-year-old stepdaughter that felt that Jeannie was her mom since her biological mom wasn't in her life. On June 13, 1993, neighbors from an adjacent unit in her apartment complained of bloody water leaking from her unit. Upon inspection, the property supervisors discovered her lifeless body in her bathroom. She had been murdered in an overkill stabbing and the water was left running. A bloody footprint was found near her body and genetic material from an unknown male was recovered from a towel, washcloth, comforter, and t-shirt. Evidence showed she was attacked from room to room and sadly suffered through a long, painstaking death. With no leads, witnesses, or media coverage, the case would go cold for nearly 30 years. In 2015, investigators reopened the case, hoping DNA technology would lead them to her killer. In 2019, the DNA was uploaded into open source DNA websites to be used for genetic genealogy research. This led investigators to a married father of two, 52-year-old Jerry Westrom. Investigators surveilled Westrom at his daughter's hockey game to ensure he was indeed the suspect. There, he bought a hot dog, and after throwing away his napkin and hot dog container, the investigators collected them. The DNA on the napkin matched the DNA from the crime scene, and he was later arrested. Westrom and his family were from Isanti, Minnesota, about 40 miles north of Minneapolis. At the time of the murder, he lived in the Twin Cities area and had several run-ins with local law enforcement for prostitution-related offenses. Months after the murder, he moved from the area and became a hockey dad. He was a locally known businessman in the Cambridge Isanti area who once owned a pair of gas stations and an appliance store. His listed home address sits just two miles from where Jeannie is buried in the Long Lake Lutheran Church Cemetery. Some of Jeannie's extended family members were even acquaintances of Westrom's. Jeannie's mother, niece, and sister made impact statements in court, and on August 25, 2022, jurors convicted Westrom of murder and sentenced him to life behind bars. Tracy Lynn Hammerberg was born in Milwaukee on March 7, 1966. At the age of 18, she was living in Sockville, Wisconsin, and attended Port Washington High School. On Friday, December 14, 1984, Tracy babysat from 7.20 p.m. to 9.45 p.m. at a house on Dry Street in Sockville. As she left, she told the woman she would be back at 7 the next morning to babysit once again. She then walked to the SNS Foods grocery store on West Decorah Road and Tower Street to meet up with some friends. They then drove to Quaid's Tavern in Port Washington, where she told the bartender she was going to a party in Grafton. The friends then went to the party at a Drake family residence on South Garfield Avenue in Port Washington. Tracy and her friends played a beer drinking game called Quarters and smoked some marijuana while at the party. Then, not long after midnight, she decided to walk the four-mile journey home. The route she walked was along Highway 33 to South Mayfair Drive. It was not uncommon for her to make the walk home from Port Washington to Sockville. She would sometimes accept rides from friends and hitchhike, but usually made it home safe and sound. However, this time was different. After leaving the party, Tracy was never seen alive again. Hours later, at 5.45 a.m., a hunter living on Maple Road north of Grafton went outside his home to retrieve his hunting gear when he saw a mid-sized, dark-colored sedan with its lights off peeling out of the driveway next door. At the same time, another hunter in the nearby woods saw the same vehicle. 
After pulling out of the driveway, the car headed south on Maple Road. Just minutes later, after 6 a.m., Dan Siraki, another resident on Maple Road, was on his way to get his morning newspaper when he shockingly found Tracy's mostly nude and battered body lying in his snowy driveway. It appeared she was still alive because as he ran inside to call the sheriff, he thought he heard her moan. After placing the call, he went back outside and stayed with Tracy until the Ozalki County Sheriff arrived. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and her clothing and shoes had been tossed close to her body. She was found wearing her boyfriend Glenn's class ring. Glenn had just recently moved to North Dakota, and Tracy had already made plans to join him. DNA found on Tracy was preserved for future testing. The sheriff's office would interview hundreds of witnesses, and over 400 men volunteered to submit to a blood typing test, eliminating them as suspects. They even brought in an FBI profiler who reported that her killer was likely someone she was acquainted with, a loner who was often aggressive. One year later, Wendy Smith, a friend and former classmate of Tracy, who was also 18 years old, was also found murdered, leading people to wonder if there was a serial killer on the loose. In 1985, Wendy was walking from a friend's house to a tavern where her mom worked, but she never arrived. Wendy had come upon Thomas Kirsch near the hill where North Wisconsin Street meets Johnson Street. It's unclear what happened next, but her body was found the next day on the hillside. Kirsch was later convicted of first-degree murder and second-degree sexual assault based on teeth mark evidence. But since his conviction, teeth marks have basically been proven to be junk science and no longer allowed in court. So many in the community believe he was just a patsy and someone else is most likely her killer. Unfortunately, in Tracy's case, no killer could be found and the case would go unsolved for the next 34 years. In early 2019, a DNA profile of the killer was built from the DNA and evidence and then used for investigative genetic genealogy by the FBI's Los Angeles Forensic Genetic Genealogy Team. The closest relative they could link to the killer was a second cousin. They then identified any male second cousins that would have been between the ages of 16 and 60 in 1984. Finally, the name Philip Cross was given to investigators as the likely suspect. Cross was a 21-year-old man at the time of the murder. After Tracy's death, Cross went on to live a life of heavy drinking and drugs that landed him in jail repeatedly. He also had children and lived as a free man between his stints in jail. In 2012, at the age of 48, he was found unresponsive in the Diamond Inn Motel in Milwaukee with a crack pipe nearby and a needle in his lap. I guess in some ways you could say that justice was served because after 2012, nobody would ever fall prey to this sick individual ever again. He was never on investigators' radars as a suspect, and when he died, the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office obtained his DNA. Detectives learned that Cross had worked the graveyard shift on the night of the murder, getting off work at midnight at a factory known as Rexnerd Plastics in Grafton. Police believe he could have picked Tracy up on Highway 33 as he was traveling home to his house on Green Bay Road in Port Washington. Tracy was familiar with the driveway where she was found and may have directed Cross to that driveway if they were looking for a place to hang out. Those who knew Cross described him as having a volatile temper when he didn't get his way, and he would have been enraged if she denied his sexual advances. On top of the drugs, alcohol, and violence, he was also known to be very vulgar to his co-workers. He also smoked Marlboro cigarettes, which were found next to Tracy's body. In 1988, several years after the murder, Cross married and moved to Sheboygan, where he attempted to strangle a woman with his belt while she was giving him a ride home from a tavern. The woman escaped and told police that she didn't know what had set him off, but she most definitely feared for her life. Cross later admitted to the incident, but claimed it happened differently. It's unclear if Cross offered Tracy a ride home on that very cold night, 
or if he snatched her off the highway before taking her life. At one point, Cross and Tracy both attended the same high school and rode the same school bus, where he liked to bully and beat up other students. Investigators believe Tracy may have hitched a ride with Cross and asked him to drop her off on the driveway. They think the two may have talked and smoked for a few minutes and that she may have rejected his advances, causing him to fly into a rage and murder her before speeding away from the crime scene. Tracy's family was so proud of the detectives for solving her case, but disappointed that he was not caught before he died. Ironically, Tracy's stepfather, Robert Lubke, had decided to move the family to Saltfield from Milwaukee just a few years earlier because it was thought to be a safer place to live. On March 14, 1968, three boys stumbled upon a woman's body in a drainage ditch on a large bean field near Newland Street and Yorktown Avenue in Huntington Beach, California. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and had received a fatal wound to her neck before being dumped out of the passenger side of a car. Tire tracks were found nearby, as well as a cigarette butt, but at the time, the police could not identify the woman or any suspects. The detectives were sent on a wild goose chase by a forensic dentist who said Jane Doe's dental work was shoddy and probably done in Mexico. That assumption would throw off the investigation and prove untrue five decades later. The Jane Doe was estimated to be white or Hispanic between the ages of 20 and 30. The Orange County coroner would have her buried in an unmarked grave in Newport Beach, California, instead of a potter's field, so that police in the future could find the body for additional testing. Her case would go unsolved for the next 52 years and become Orange County's oldest known Jane Doe case. Over the years, Numerous reconstructions were created and released in hopes of someone recognizing her. Then, in 2001, DNA extracted from Jane Doe's clothing and the sexual assault kit was linked to an unknown male. It would take another 10 years to link the DNA from the cigarette butt to the DNA from the sexual assault kit. But still, investigators could not find the suspect. The DNA profiles were uploaded to CODIS, but there were no matches. Fast forward to 2019, blood collected from her shirt was used to create a partial DNA profile. That profile was used to begin the process of genetic genealogy and would lead them to the identification of suspect Johnny Crisco. Crisco had been discharged from the Army in 1963 after he was diagnosed with positive aggressive reaction, which is a pattern of being quick to anger, easy to feel unjustly treated, a constant feeling of resentment towards others, immaturity, and impulsivity. He also had an arrest record consisting of one arrest in 1971 in Orange County, but other than these details, not much else is known about him. He passed away from throat cancer in 2015 at the age of 71, less than five years before being identified as Anita's killer. In 2020, using the same technology and investigative genetic genealogy performed by renowned forensic genealogist Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, Jane Doe was finally identified as Anita Louise Pateau. Anita was born on March 9, 1942, and grew up in Augusta, Maine. In 1967, at the age of 25, she left Maine and moved to Southern California with a dream of making it in Hollywood. She frequently wrote letters back home, but in 1968, they would suddenly stop. Her family last heard from her in February 1968, just a couple of weeks before being found. She had sent her family a letter and a postcard home to Maine, saying she had visited Hollywood, taken a tour of movie stars' homes, and explained that she had found a job as a waitress in California. But Anita never returned home to see her family, and they never received another letter. They didn't know what happened to her, but felt it likely wasn't good because she would have never stopped communicating with them. 
So they hired a private investigator to try and locate her, but he was unsuccessful. Her body was found hours after she was murdered and just five days after turning 26. After being identified, Anita's remains were exhumed and returned to Maine, where her family had a memorial service. She was reinterred on July 18, 2020, in Waterville, Maine, next to her sister, Constance, who passed away four years earlier. At the ceremony, David Deer King, an investigator from Orange County, spoke about the decades of painstaking detective work it had taken to identify not only Anita, but her killer as well. Mr. Deer King came across the case as a Huntington police officer in the 1990s and said the meticulous collection of evidence at the original crime scene had allowed investigators to solve the crime decades later. Anita's family never knew that authorities had worked so hard to identify her. One of her distant cousins, who never met her, Steve Sabo, recalled reading in a book of family history, written in French, that Anita had run away from Maine as a teenager. Anita had six siblings that searched for her all that time, but only two surviving sisters and one brother were alive when she was finally identified. Tangi Lynn Sims was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee on August 21, 1971. At the age of 25, Tangi was now living in Aurora, Colorado. On August 24, 1996, Tangi was assaulted, stabbed to death, and left in an alley in the 1200 block of Iola Street in Aurora. Tangi had last been seen the night before at East Colfax Avenue and Joliet Street, walking towards a semi-tractor with a sleeper cab that didn't have a trailer attached. It's not clear whether Tangi was a prostitute, but the area she was in was known for sex workers. During Tangi's murder, the killer accidentally cut himself, leaving drops of blood at the scene. Samples of the blood were taken for evidence, and it was believed that the blood would lead them quickly to a suspect, but that's not how the case played out. The case would go unsolved until late 2019 when detectives sent it over to United Data Connect Laboratory, a company founded by former Denver District Attorney Mitch Morrissey, specializing in genetic genealogy investigations. Their goal was to find a close relative of the killer through DNA testing of the blood samples left at the crime scene. Using forensic genetic genealogy, they were able to successfully find a relative of the killer. Once detectives had a name, they got to work to prove who killed Tangi. The leads took detectives to Idaho and North Dakota, where they obtained DNA from the suspect's immediate family. By early 2020, authorities had named Wesley Backman as the suspect in Tangi's murder. Backman was a truck driver who lived in many places, including Aurora, Colorado but he would never serve any time for his crimes because he died in 2008 at the age of 53. Hopefully, Tangi's family can now have some closure. At the age of 72, Claire Holman, nicknamed Kay, was living at 744 Tilting Tea Drive in the small desert town of Borrejo Springs, California. Kay was a retired hairdresser and was living alone because her husband had passed away. On the night of March 21, 1944, a friend of Kay stopped by her house to deliver her mail. Unfortunately, she would find Kay strangled to death in her home. On top of that, they suspected Kay had been sexually assaulted. The motive appeared to be robbery, which means it could have been a random act and that made the chances of solving it even more difficult. Without any leads and before advancements in technology, the case would go cold. Nine years later, in 2003, a lab discovered and collected an unknown male's DNA and created a DNA profile. They entered the profile into CODIS, but there were no matches. Another 18 years would go by before a Barrejo Springs cold case team would reopen her case. Finally, they were able to collect DNA from a strand of hair found at the crime scene. 
through the use of genetic genealogy, the DNA would lead authorities to the identity of her killer, Jerry DeWayne Robeson. There was only one problem. Robeson had died of cancer in 2007 at the age of 64. Because of this, investigators had to seek the help of relatives of Robeson who agreed to provide their DNA. Once their DNA was tested, it proved to be a match. Robeson was 51 at the time of the murder and worked as a plumber. They believe Robeson was most likely hired by Kay to do work at her home on a number of occasions. That's when this SOB decided to prey on a defenseless elderly woman. I don't know about y'all, but I believe karma definitely caught up with him. 